Welcome back. As you could tell from that little video clip, today we're going to talk about the transistor. Because the invention of the computer wasn't enough to launch a digital revolution, you often have to have two or three innovations that come together at the same time. And that's what happened in the late 1940s when the computer is invented using sometimes electromechanical switches, sometimes vacuum tubes. Also, then the transistor gets invented and eventually becomes the microchip, which is just a chip with a whole lot of transistors on it. And finally, the network gets invented. So it takes those three inventions to do it. And the transistor, it's like the dynamo. It's like the steam engine at the heart of the digital revolution. And it was invented by these three people, Walter uh, 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 Bratton in the top right, John Bardeen in the top middle, and at the microscope, uh, a guy named William Shockley. But there's another great character in this tale, and that's Bell Labs, because sometimes it's not just people, but an environment that causes innovation to happen. And as we talked about in earlier lectures, Bell Labs, originally right on the west side of Manhattan, and then in Murray Hill, New Jersey, was a place that brought together all sorts of diverse talents. As I said, Claude Shannon was there, the guy who was the information theorist who figured out how you could do logic in circuits using on off switches. Einstein visited. It also had pole climbers who knew how to amplify a telephone signal. It had business people who figured out the importance of long distance phone calls. It had material scientists, theorists, and great experimentalists. And in particular, they were working on something just out of theory something called semiconductors. This is in the 1930s. Sometimes science progresses and innovation progresses just because of basic curiosity. And there were people who were interested in elements that were semiconducting materials. In other words, there's some elements like copper that are really good conductors and other elements that are not at all good conductors. And then there are ones that are halfway in between like silicon or germanium. And even more importantly, if you dope them, if you sort of inject them with impurities, like if you hit some silicon with some boron and you make it more impure with the boron, then you can change how good of a conductor it is. And you, it, this took theorists as well as experimentalists, as well as material scientists. The theorists were looking at how quantum mechanics affects the dance of electrons on the surface straight, on the surface of semiconducting materials. And then there were experimentalists and material scientists who were cooking up new materials in order to make better equipment for the phone company, stronger types of materials. And they, you know, make alloys and mix things together, take things like silicon and uh, hit it with some impurities. And they created in the 1930s, a study group at Bell Lab that combined all the theorists and the experimentalists and the business people who were interested in solid state materials. In other words, materials like silicon that were solid, but somehow you could make them do things. It was led by a guy named William Shockley, totally brilliant, perhaps too brilliant by half, guy from California, had a horrible temper even as a kid. All he did was throw tantrums. Later in life, he becomes paranoid racist and nobody can work with him. But during the 1930s, he put together a group that was a solid state study group at Bell Labs. Uh, Shockley was a theorist. They said that Shockley could sort of envision how electrons dance on the surface of materials, the mathematics of how they move. And he needed a partner, an experimentalist. And that was Walter Bratton, a guy from the mountain states, kind of crusty and cantankerous, but in a humorous way. And he loved making gadgets and sticking things into sort of vacuum bottles and putting wax on it and finding new ways to make things work. They were all put in this group by the head of AT&T, Mervyn Kelly, the solid state group. And their mission was to create a replacement for the vacuum tube using semiconductors. Because man, you got a vacuum tube that sort of a vacuum with a hot filament in it and all, these things burn out. They use up a lot, a lot of electricity. If 
you could make an on-off switch like a vacuum tube, but do it out of a solid state material like silicon, that would be golden because it would never burn out. Uh, it would never get too hot. It wouldn't use much electricity. After World War II ended, uh, John Bardeen replaces uh, William Shockley as the theorist working with Bratton because Shockley got moved upstairs and he's in a more management position. So it's Bardeen and Bratton who work together to figure out how you're going to take a piece of germanium or silicon, how you're going to stick little wires into it, how you're going to get below the surface state where the electrons kind of get mush together and they don't move well enough, how you put an electric field next to it to move the electrons off of that surface state, and even how you jam paper clips and other things into it with little dabs of wax in order to make a contraption that will be an on-off switch or an amplifier just like a vacuum tube. And on December 16th, 1947, a rainy Tuesday afternoon, in New Jersey at Bell Labs. They finally get it to work. They call all their supervisors down to see it. Of course, one of the supervisors is William Shockley. And he is both excited that the people at Bell Labs have created the transistor, and he's a little bit jealous or paranoid. He feels that it was based on his idea and that he should get credit for it as well. In fact, he insists that whenever they put out a publicity photo of the people who invented the transistor, He's in it. There he is right in the middle looking at the microscope. And that picture used to drive Walter Bratton, who's on the top right, absolutely mad because that's Walter Bratton's microscope. And just as the photographer is about to take the picture, Shockley sits down, grabs the microscope, and it makes it look, him be the center of attention. They don't speak, Bratton uh, and Bardeen are friends. But the two of them don't speak to Shockley for years afterwards. Shockley tries to get his own patent for a different type of transistor. They finally meet again when the three of them are awarded the Nobel Prize for inventing uh, the transistor. There's Bardeen uh, shaking hands uh, with the king of uh, Sweden. They go to Stockholm. There's Bratton behind him. And of course, Shockley is there as well. They meet in the bar the night before the ceremony and make up. Bardeen becomes the lead on the patent. There's the patent. You can see the little pieces of metal being stuck into the semiconducting material. AT&T gets this patent. But AT&T does something really smart. Uh, they were facing antitrust violations. They were a monopoly, the phone company. And the Justice Department was trying to figure out do we prosecute them just like Standard Oil had been for being a monopoly? And in order to uh, make sure that they weren't leveraging their monopoly, they took the patent for the transistor and many other things like the laser and licensed it quite openly to any company who wanted it so that companies couldn't think that uh, AT&T and the Bell Labs was using its monopoly to dominate other fields. And so for a mere $25,000, almost any company could get this patent. That's particularly interesting because up until then, the transistor was a brilliant invention and probably was helping making some computers, but it wasn't a mass market product until a small company named Texas Instruments run by a guy named Jack Kilby, which is mainly doing offshore oil exploration and equipment decided to license the patent to make transistors and it started making down in texas lots of transistors but there wasn't that much of a market for them they want thousands of people saying hey i want to buy a transistor so sometimes innovation comes not just from the person who comes up with the idea and not just from the people who execute the idea but for the people who figure out a business model for the idea how to market the idea and that's what Texas Instrument, Pat Haggerty, Jack Kilby down there do, is they come up with something that nobody knew they really needed in order to get people to buy transistors. And that, of course, is the transistor radio, 1954, comes into being. Other big companies, RCA, they try to interest them in making the transistor radio. RCA says nobody wants a radio of their own. People have radios in their living room. So they had a small company 
named Regency do it. But that's part of the digital age, is there's the transistor radio, the Regency, like the iPod, which we also didn't know we need when Steve Jobs invented it. We had no idea we needed a thousand songs in our pocket till the iPod came along. People didn't know they needed a portable radio with music until the transistor radio comes along. And like the iPod, uh, they make it in all sorts of wonderful colors and people can take it to the beach with them. And interestingly enough, I started this lecture by saying, sometimes you need more than one or two innovations to come together to create an industry. We have the transistor, you have the notion of the portable radio, and the third part of that mix, people going to the beach, having parties, listening to it, is the invention of rock and roll, also in 1954. You might say, rock and roll, how does that fit into the technology? Well, if it hadn't been for the transistor radio, Elvis Presley, right there, who came out with his first album in 1954, would have had trouble getting people to listen to him because if you had to sit in your parents' living room and tune the family radio, they weren't going to let you listen to rock and roll music in Elvis Presley. But when the portable transistor radio came in, young people could take it to dances. They could take it to the beach. They could have their own music. And so the transistor radio leads to the birth of rock and roll, but also the birth of rock and roll leads to a demand for transistor radios because young people wanted to have it and to be able to listen to their favorite music. I was uh, pretty young then, but by the late 1950s, I remember getting my first transistor radio. Uh, the transistor radios had uh, you know, two transistors or four transistors. If you got a really good one and it cost like $28, you get an eight transistor radio. It was good enough that for me, I could listen to WLS radio from here in New Orleans up in, I could hear, I could get the signal from St. Louis. So I could listen to the St. Louis Cardinals game and Harry Carey announcing them. And so we all got these radios so that we could listen to our sports, or we could sit in our room and hear this strange music. And of course, we could become part of listening to Elvis Presley, and then the Beatles, because we had our own radio. And that is a theme of the digital revolution, is that progress in digital technology makes everything smaller and more personal. We'll see that with the computer. ENIAC, huge, took up the size of three bedrooms just to fit it in. But eventually, you get a personal computer, like the one on your desk. Likewise, music becomes personal. Everything we do electronically goes from being part of a big machine to something that is personal, that's our own. And that is the great theme of the digital revolution.